This is the fourth video in a series on the Septuagint. If you haven't already, please see the introduction video. This video will explain the Septuagint's influence on the New Testament writers as they quoted from the Old Testament. It will also share what happened to the Septuagint, which was once so popular. Jesus and the Apostles had access to both Greek and Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. Since the Septuagint and the Masoretic, as we have them today, have such obvious differences, which Old Testament manuscripts do you think Jesus and the Apostles used? Did they favor the Hebrew or the Greek? If there was a set of scriptures that Jesus and the Apostles used, it would certainly be the Septuagint, not today's Masoretic text. For the Christian, there is a wonderful way to know which manuscript family is more accurate. When one compares a New Testament quotation from the Old Testament, 20% of the time the quotation is the same in the Septuagint and the Masoretic. But of the 80% that differ, 90% follow the Septuagint while only 10% follow the Masoretic. In other words, the writers of the New Testament favored the Greek Septuagint over today's Masoretic Hebrew 9 times out of 10. This isn't really surprising since the Septuagint family of manuscripts is 1,100 years older than the Masoretic family of manuscripts. Whenever the New Testament quotes a passage from the Old Testament, most Bibles have a footnote giving the reference for where that passage can be found. One may also notice that a number of these footnotes may include the letters LXX. This means that the New Testament writer followed the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew. For example, if you were to go to that Old Testament reference in your Bible, you may notice that it reads a lot differently than how the New Testament writer quoted it. Why would a cross-reference send you to a verse that reads so differently than it does in the New Testament? This is because practically all English translations of the Old Testament use the Hebrew Masoretic text, while the New Testament writers primarily used the Greek Septuagint. Let's look at a few significant examples of New Testament quotations from the Old Testament and how they follow the Septuagint. Jesus quoted an Old Testament prophecy about himself, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a quotation of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The second portion of this prophecy reads in our Bibles, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There are some notable differences here, but the main thing is that Isaiah in our Bibles omits an important phrase that appeared in Luke's Gospel, recovery of sight to the blind. This phrase, which Jesus said about himself, is not found in the Hebrew we have today. Where is this prophecy about the Messiah giving sight to the blind? It is found in the Septuagint. He has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the broken in heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. What does this mean? This means that when Jesus read from the scriptures, he read from the Greek Septuagint and not from today's Masoretic Hebrew. Hebrews 10.5 quotes the Old Testament saying, You did not want sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. This is a prophecy about Jesus' incarnation and crucifixion. But if you search for this in our English Bibles, which is based off the Masoretic Manuscripts, you will not find this in the Old Testament. Yet this is a quotation of Psalm 40 verse 6, which reads in our Bibles, You do not delight in sacrifice and offering, you open my ears to listen. Where is the prophecy about the sacrifice of the Messiah's body? It is found in the Septuagint. Sacrifice and offering you will not but a body you have prepared for me. The writer of Hebrews quoted this prophecy about Jesus being the Messiah from the Greek Septuagint and not from the Hebrew Masoretic. Paul quotes from the Old Testament in Galatians 3.13 saying, It is written, Everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. You will find this in our Bibles at Deuteronomy 21.23. Though Paul is showing that this is referring to Jesus Christ, 
who hung on a tree and became a curse for us, our Old Testament leaves out the tree. Our Bibles, which follow the Masoretic, read, He who is hanged is accursed of God. If your Bible has the phrase, on a tree, in Deuteronomy 21 and 23, this means that the translators have favored either Paul's quotation or the Septuagint. This is because the Masoretic omits the words, on a tree, in that phrase. Yet the Septuagint reads, Everyone that is hanged on a tree is cursed of God. Though not quoted in the New Testament, a popular passage in the Old Testament that prophesied Jesus' crucifixion is Psalm 22. Though the Masoretic still has strong prophecies about Christ in Psalm 22, there are a couple more in the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, Psalm 22:16 reads, For many dogs encompass me, the assembly of the wicked doers has beset me round, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is such a strong prophecy about the crucifixion that most English Bible translations actually quote the Septuagint instead of the Masoretic. The Masoretic text reads, For dogs have encompassed me, a company of evildoers have enclosed me, like a lion they are at my hands and my feet. In the Masoretic, Psalm 22:20 20 reads, Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of these dogs. However, the Septuagint reads, Deliver my soul from the sword, my only begotten one, from the power of the dog. Does that title, Only Begotten, ring a bell? The Apostle John used the exact same Greek word that the Septuagint used, monogenes, when he wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Contrary to a common belief, John didn't use a brand new title for Jesus. He used the same Greek word the Septuagint translators used 300 years before. The most significant difference between the Masoretic and the Septuagint is where Matthew quotes a prophecy from Isaiah 7.14 saying, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. There has been important discussions among Christians regarding Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. The Old Testament reads, The Lord himself will give you a sign. She will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. Now what does Isaiah call this woman? Of course, because of Matthew's quotation, Christians recognize that she should be called a virgin. This is an essential prophecy about Jesus being the Messiah. When the Revised Standard Version published this verse in 1952, it said she was a young woman. This caused a number of Christians to accuse the RSV for mistranslating this verse. In the Masoretic text, the Hebrew word is Alma, which literally means a young woman. Now, young woman is a general term. It might include virgin women, but it does not have to be that specific. In fact, the Hebrew word for virgin is Bethula, and this word is not found in Isaiah 7.14. But in the Septuagint, the Greek word is parthenos, which means virgin, the exact same word Matthew used. Here is a question. When the translators of the Septuagint came to Isaiah 7.14 in their Hebrew manuscripts to translate it into Greek, did they find Alma, young woman, or did they find Bethula, virgin? Sadly, the Hebrew manuscript family from the 3rd century BC has been lost. But think about it this way. Who has ever heard of a virgin giving birth? Certainly, the translators who lived 300 years before Christ would think that such an idea was ridiculous. If they had come across Alma, then they would have easily translated it as a young woman. However, the fact that they still translated this word into Greek as Parthenos, virgin, shows that they went against logic, which demands that only non-virgin women give birth and they chose to be true to the Hebrew they saw, which must have read Bethula, virgin. However, our Masoretic manuscripts today have Alma, young woman. So, amazingly, the Revised Standard Version's translation saying young woman is actually completely accurate to the Hebrew. But because of Christianity, most translations abandon the Hebrew word there in favor of the Septuagint's word virgin. When looking at the New Testament, 
We have seen six major differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic. All of them had to do with prophecies about the Messiah. These differences will continue in future videos in this series. One by one, we will go through every New Testament quotation from the Old Testament. Stay tuned for those. So why is the Old Testament and every English Bible translated from the Hebrew Masoretic instead of the Greek Septuagint? If Jesus, the Apostles, and the early Church used the Septuagint, why don't we? First, we have to talk about the Jews. Legend has it that around AD 90, the Jews called a meeting called the Council of Jamnia. There, they decided to react to the rapid spread of Christianity. They saw how the Christians were proving the deity of Jesus Christ through the Septuagint. So they began saying that the Septuagint was an inferior translation, abandoning it, even though it had been fully approved for at least 300 years before the Christians came. The Hebrew manuscripts in their day had various differences. The Jews let the manuscripts that more supported the prophecies about Jesus being deity and Messiah die off, while they let the manuscripts that minimized the prophecies about Jesus survive. The Jews might very well have altered some Hebrew manuscripts. Though it is true that the Jews completely abandoned the Septuagint because of Christianity, there is no evidence that the Council of Jamnia itself was a real council. But the sudden Jewish rejection of the Septuagint was so clear that in the 2nd century the Jews introduced three new Greek translations of the Old Testament. These were translated by Theodotion, Aquila of Sinope, and Symmachus. As time passed, the Jewish tradition of copying the Greek Septuagint was lost in favor of these other translations. The translations by Theodotion and Aquila were different from the Septuagint. They might have purposefully attempted to reduce the prophecies that proved Jesus was the Messiah. For example, their translations did not translate Isaiah 7.14 as virgin, as the Septuagint did, which is a major proof that Jesus is the Christ, but they translated it as young woman. About that, Arrhenius wrote, Among those now presuming to expound the scripture, behold, a young woman shall conceive and bring forth a son, as interpreted by Theodotion the Ephesian and Aquila of Pontus, both Jewish proselytes. But the Septuagint was interpreted into Greek by the Jews themselves, long before the period of our Lord's coming. The Jews did put this interpretation into these words, that is, translating it virgin. They indeed, had they known of our future existence, would themselves never have hesitated to burn their own scriptures, that is, their copies of the Septuagint. We saw how the Jews rejected the Septuagint, but the question remains, why do today's English Bibles reject the Septuagint? When the Reformation occurred in the 1500s, the Reformers went to the Masoretic text for two reasons. It was in the possession of the Jews, and it was in the Hebrew language. Certainly, Going to the Jews and the Hebrew language for the Old Testament is the best way to get it, right? But the Reformers failed to recognize the value of the Septuagint and how it was the translation of the Old Testament for Jesus, the Apostles, and pre-Nicene Christianity. They also failed to recognize that the Septuagint manuscripts are over 1,000 years older than the Masoretic manuscripts and that the Septuagint had been translated and accepted by the Jews before Christianity. And this tradition from the Reformers has been passed down to today, and is why English Bibles are translated from the Masoretic text. Here are some quotations from pre-Nicene Christians concerning their belief that the Septuagint is superior to the Hebrew. Arrhenius recognized that Jesus and the Apostles followed the Septuagint and agreed with it. For the Apostles, since they are of more ancient date than all these heretics, agree with this translation. And the translation harmonizes with the tradition of the Apostles. For Peter, John, Matthew, Paul, and the rest successively, as well as their followers, explained all prophecies just as the interpretation of the seventy elders contains them. As to why there was less content in the Hebrew than there was in the Septuagint, Origen said that wicked Jews removed these additional passages. He wrote, Why then, 
is the history not in their Daniel, if, as you say, their wise men hand down by tradition such stories? The answer is that they hid from the knowledge of the people as many of the passages which contained any scandal against the elders, rulers, and judges as they could, some of which have been preserved in uncanonical writings. As an example, take the story about Isaiah, and guaranteed by the epistle to the Hebrews, which is found in none of their public books. For the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, in speaking of the prophets and what they suffered, says, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, and they were slain with the sword. To whom, I ask, does the sawn asunder refer? For by an old idiom, not particular to Hebrew, but also found in Greek, this is said to be plural, although it refers to but one person. Now we know very well that the tradition says that Isaiah the prophet was sawn asunder, and this is found in some apocryphal work, which probably the Jews have purposefully tampered with, introducing some phrases manifestly incorrect that discredit might be thrown on the whole. Let us see now if these cases are not forced to the conclusion that while the Savior gives a true account of them, none of the scriptures which could prove what he tells are to be found. For they who build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, condemning the crimes of their fathers committed against the righteous and prophets, say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In the blood of what prophets? Can anyone tell me? For where do we find anything like this written in Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of the twelve minor prophets or Daniel? Then about Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who is slain between the temple and the altar, we learn from Jesus only, not knowing it otherwise from any scripture. Wherefore, I think no other supposition is possible than that they who had the reputation of wisdom and the rulers and elders took away from the people every passage which might bring them to discredit among the people. We need not wonder, then, if this history of the evil device of the licentious elders against Susanna is true, but was concealed and removed from the scriptures by the men themselves not very far removed from the council of these elders. In the Acts of the Apostles also, Stephen, in his other testimony, says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. That Stephen speaks the truth, everyone will admit, who receives the Acts of the Apostles. But it is impossible to show from the extant books of the Old Testament how with any justice he throws the blame of having persecuted and slain the prophets on the fathers of those who believed not in Christ. What I have said is, I think, sufficient to prove that it would be nothing wonderful if this history were true, and the licentious and cruel attack was actually made on Susanna by those who were at that time elders, and written down by the wisdom of the Spirit, but removed by these rulers of Sodom, as the Spirit would call them. Origen said that it was foolish for Christians to go to the Jews for the Old Testament, especially when Jesus and the Apostles used the Greek Septuagint. Origen said this very sarcastically. Indeed, when we notice such differences, we immediately reject as false the copies in use in our churches. We command the Brotherhood to put away the sacred books currently used among them, and we coax and persuade the Jews to give us copies, which will certainly be untampered with and free from forgery. In the end, what should we do with the Masoretic? Should we throw it out along with our English Bibles which are translated from it? No. The Masoretic still contains many strong prophecies that Jesus is the Messiah. Don't be afraid to use the Old Testament in your Bible, but be aware that the Old Testament in your hands could be much more accurate. If you consider yourself to be a student of the Bible and have been convinced of the Septuagint's superiority, Pray that it will become more popular among Christians in the future. You can help by sharing this series of videos with your friends and church leaders. Also, I highly recommend adding an English translation of the Septuagint to your library. Here are a few good options. Sir Lancelot Brenton's translation is extremely good, which is used in this video. 
He translated it in the early 1800s, so it is somewhat difficult to read. There is also the Nets translation of the Septuagint, which is currently free to download. And there is the Orthodox Study Bible. It is a 2008 translation of the Septuagint, with the New King James Version for the New Testament. Again, this will be an ongoing series. Videos following this one will go through the New Testament and analyze each quotation from the Old Testament and compare them between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. There is a link to the full playlist in the description. Thank you for watching.